I'd like to welcome you all here to this uh, second uh, webinar uh, with the heads of network, uh, national networks of the Anna Lynn Foundation. Uh, in this case, the heads of network, I will be introducing them shortly from Croatia, from uh, Turkey, from Bulgaria and Israel. Uh, and this is a webinar that's part of a project, an Anna Lind uh, Foundation funded project uh, called COVAD is, Euro COVAD is Euromed Civil Society. And it's a project uh, where many institutions are involved, including as, as the head of the project, the National Foundation for Civil Society Development of Croatia, of which one of our speakers is, is the head. Um, the European Institute of the Mediterranean, IEMED in Barcelona, the Center for Education uh, Research and Action for TOESA in Athens, and the House of European Roads, and uh, the Center for Euro uh, European, International European Studies at Kadir Has University in Istanbul, of which I have the honor to lead. So my, my name is Dimitri Dafilu, and uh, this is part of the project requirements, but it's been, it, it's, it's a second series. We had our first series, some of you have watched it in December, where we had at the time the heads of network from, uh, from Germany, from Lebanon, from Greece uh, and Tunisia. And uh, that gave very interesting perspectives on trying to see the state of civil society in, in the 25, 26 early years we're moving into since the launch of the Barcelona process. Uh, and, and of course, how civil society has been, has affected, has been affected in the Euromed region. Uh, also in the, the countries uh, that are part of the Barcelona process, and also in particular uh, how COVID-19 has affected civil society and our institutions in a number of ways. So um, with us are four, four panelists, four speakers that we'll be having conversation with. So the first one is Vetanya Plavsha Matic. She's the, the director of the National Foundation for Civil Society Development, the lead partner uh, in this project uh, in Croatia. Uh, and, and, and this, her foundation is a public foundation with the basic, basic purpose of promoting and developing civil society in the Republic of, of Croatia. It's a huge foundation, right? 102 employees working in a number, at the foundation's headquarters in Zagreb and in a number of regional offices in Osijek, uh, Rijeka and Split. Um, now, Svetanya was the first, uh, before joining the foundation, she's been the head, the director since 2003. She was the first head of the government office for cooperation with NGOs uh, between 1998 and 2003. And, and, and uh, had been, uh, that was, uh, she was, I mean, as a public servant, a government official, but has been a public servant previously as well in a number of capacities. Uh, before uh, taking over uh, this uh, foundation. Uh, it has been responsible for a number of uh, grant scheme for CSO uh, in, in uh, the government office for cooperation with NGOs, uh, a project of uh, over 20 million uh, euros uh, or in a five year, uh, five year period. And she's now responsible for the management of the her foundation's uh, grant schemes for CSOs. Um, she's a member of the governing board, uh, governing council of the European Foundation Center in Brussels, a member, a member of Daphne also in Brussels, a member of the transnational uh, Giving Europe, again, another Brussels-based institution, and a number of others. I will not go through them, um, but uh, as you can see, it's someone who's very well versed in, in, uh, in uh, the work of, of CSOs uh, uh, in general as a practitioner. Our second speaker will be uh, Nejdet um, Sarlam, Sarlam, who is from Anadolu. He's a professor of business administration at Anadolu University, Anadolu University in, uh, in Turkey, in Eskishahir, Turkey. He's a director uh, himself of the Association of Civil Society and Development uh, Institute and the coordinator of, of uh, the Turkish Network of the Annalyn Foundation. And he's also the, the director of uh, Tuan Innovation R&D Research Company uh, he has a number of publications and books uh, and teaching material on NGOs, uh, SMEs, uh, and so on. And, and uh, he has worked both for the, in the governmental, uh, private, and uh, CSO uh, sector, delivering a number of training. Um, and and uh, the, the Turkish network has, uh, over the last year in particular, become very, very, very active in trying to mobilize and uh, generate activities. Uh, the third speaker will be. Um, uh, Kostadinka Todorova, who is the founder and chairperson of the International Initiatives, Co uh, Initiatives for Cooperation Association of Bulgaria. 
and, and uh, this organization is working in the field of community development, active citizenship and non-formal education. Uh, Kostadinka has over 20 years experience in project development and management. She has coordinated uh, large scale projects on national and international level within the framework of Bulgarian uh, operational programs, EU programs such as Erasmus Plus, Europe's of Citizen, Interreg program, and, and a number of others. And of course, she's also the coordinator, the Bulgarian coordinator, national coordinator of the Anna Lind Foundation since 2007. She's a de dedicated youth uh, worker and trainer and has contributed to a number of guides and manuals produced uh, by the International Initiative for Cooperation Association. And, and the last speaker is the head of network from uh, National Head of Network from Israel. And it's interesting, as I was looking through your bios, we, he's another academic. So we have two academics involved in civil society work and two practitioners that have been had long careers uh, in civil society activities uh, through their NGOs. So, so Muli Peleg is the director of the International School at the uh, Oranim College. He's a political sociologist uh, specializing in conflict analysis and conflict resolution processes, negotiating processes and, and sustainability. Uh, he returned to Israel in 2019 uh, after having spent 10 years uh, first uh, in the US, uh, first as a, uh, as a Schusterman professor at Rutgers University and later at Columbia and Fordham Universities, uh, Rutgers in New Jersey, Columbia and Fordham in New York. Um, he's also a research fellow at the Stanford Center for International Conflict Resolution Negotiation. Uh, the author of many articles and books about conflict analysis and resolution, violence, protest, and dialogue. Uh, he specializes in negotiation processes and peace building operations and has been a top advisor in leadership and negotiations to the Paris Center for Peace. And he has taken uh, part in a number of uh, several rounds of peace negotiated between Israelis and Palestinians, as well as uh, Israelis and Jordanians, counseled the prime minister's office, the foreign office, and, and the national security council so this are just brief mentions of, of their uh, all our speakers um, cvs extensive cvs and career so without further ado uh, i've asked them to basically give about a 10 minute small presentation on how they see the state of civil society uh in the euromed area over the last 25 years since uh, the, the barcelona declaration of november 2000 uh, 20 years, uh, five, and, and, uh, and also to talk a little bit about uh, how civil society, as I said, uh, uh, has been affected over this period, um, even mention what's happening in their countries if they want, and also how COVID-19 has also had or not had an impact on civil society development. So Svetanya, the floor is yours. Please turn on and mute yourself. Okay. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. OK, thank you, Dimitrios. Um, uh, I'm really glad that we have that uh, opportunity to discuss about the state of art of the civil society on the Euromed uh, region, uh, especially 25 years after the Barcelona process. I think that we really achieve a lot in these 25 years, but there is a lot of challenges also in front of us, and we can witness that uh, in each of our countries. And also, especially now when we are uh, faced with this uh, pandemic and this COVID that really change our lives. Um, and I'm really sad that we, we didn't have opportunity to meet in person uh, in April last year, when we were planning this big forum in Šibenik in Croatia, we were expecting um, something around 1,000 people from 42 countries, and it will definitely be something very valuable for all of us to to see each other, to discuss, and to uh, to make some further uh, and deeper understanding of uh, where we are and what we want to do together in the future. So now we are using this technology and I'm grateful that we have that, but um, it couldn't replace the, the human touch and human you know, presence. So I really believe, and, and Muli just said previously when we were discussing at the beginning, that he is optimistic, but and I, I'm also optimistic. I really want to, to see each other um, in this year or uh, at least next year 
uh, that we can come together and discuss about what what uh, what what are the challenges that we have in front of, uh, of in front of us. So uh, I think that we when we uh, joined when Croatia joined the uh, Analint um, uh, family, um, it was eleven years ago. Uh, we established our Croatian network, so with uh, more than one hundred participants. And we managed to, to find a way to, to discuss and to collaborate with the different countries and different uh, member organizations of the, of the national um, head of networks in, in different countries. And it's really give another perspective for, for our members. And I believe that uh, having this uh, chance to be a part of a bigger family uh, it's really opening the horizons of all of us as the persons, but also as the organizations that we we can see that we are not alone in some you know troubles or challenges that we are facing, but at the same time we can see that there is uh, uh, also better or not so good uh, you know situation in in other countries, so that we can see okay, so we are we are still missing something or we are still working on that uh, or there are fellow uh, you know members and organization and countries where they find some solutions that we can follow or we can say okay we can we can exchange these uh, uh, results of some um, of some you know program and projects that these organizations manage manage to create in, in their own countries so from my point, I think that we, in the Euro Med region, I think that we managed to, to do a lot in the area of exchange between people and between organizations. Um, I still think that we have to work on the, on the very concrete way of our uh, connecting and uh, understanding the different, uh, you know, uh, different starting points or the different uh, uh, situations that we have in our countries. I believe that each of our countries has um, very, you know, challenging time for the civil society due to, to, due to the COVID-19 situation. Um, and we, I don't know how in other countries is the, is the uh, solutions uh, driven from that. But we managed to, to support our organizations as much as we, we could during last year. Uh, we created new possibilities for networking, but also for funding uh, for the different projects and programs. We are just launching, uh, it will be next uh, week, we will launch one special uh, call for proposal for all the civil society organizations who are you know now trying to bridge the uh, situation that they couldn't uh, implement all the activities that they were used to do for their uh, beneficiaries uh, uh, and they have to go online wherever they could uh, and we are now helping them to bridge this situation and to find a way how to uh, modify their services and their work with the with the beneficiaries to be on a proper way, satisfied with, with the way how they are uh, working and implementing these, these activities. We, at the beginning of this crisis um, uh, in March last year, we started one initiative that we call Community Potential, because we realized that um, we have to create uh, communities uh, that could be resilient and uh, that could be uh, sustainable uh, and they have to work together citizens, civil society organizations, uh, local authorities and business in a local on a local level mm -hmm. uh, with the new models, not necessarily typical uh, profit business, but you know something that we, now support for 12, 13 years, it is the social entrepreneurship models that could also help the civil society to, to find some sustainable way of uh, operation and funding of their operations. So 
we are uh, implementing now this new program because we, we strongly believe that we have to go back to the communities and that we have to create the possibilities of uh, building the post-COVID society from bottom up, you know, from community and then, you know, create some common uh, added values to, to our society. So from the program of the community potential, we are now identifying the change makers in local communities that could bring additional or, you know, alternative uh, way of solving the problems of uh, local community. And we are, uh, we are work these change makers are uh, mainly from civil society organizations because they are really always the, the, the uh, somebody who is always on a, on a front line and they wanted to, to do something good for the community and for the society. So we, are, we divide this program on the two levels. First level is the very short, very brief and very focused uh, uh, education and training for the uh, change makers. And then on the second phase, we are going to support them in the implementation of the uh, their action plans in the, co in the community where they are going to work on the synergy between all stakeholders in, in the community, having the civil society organization as a, in, in a focus on uh, of these changes and uh, synergic work of the different stakeholders. We also offer that as an uh, opportunity for other uh, countries in the Euro-Mediterranean area. We, we publish that uh, as a call, we call that uh, knowledge and experience exchange program, KEEP. So the, this is what uh, we are also um, having in mind that it could be some kind of uh, uh, program that could bring us the, again to, together that we can globally in the Euro-Mediterranean region start to think about changes, start to, to invest in people who can, and in the processes as well, uh, who can create the space for change, change for better, to have inclusive society, to have open, modern, um, if it is necessary, digital, but in any case, sustainable um, societies that could count on, on the you know, uh, protection of uh, nature and having uh, and being open for the differences and being open for dialogue between different stakeholders, these different individuals in, in, in our communities and in our societies. So this is what we are, we managed to do in, in this uh, short period of one year now, uh, and from since it started in March last, last year. And we believe that uh, it could be long-term investment in, um, in the societies that we would like to live in future. So that's from me for the beginning and I'm open for discussions as well. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Tatana. It's very, very interesting. Uh, uh, you outlined the, the initiatives that, uh, that, that you have launched. Uh, it's interesting and I think we'll get probably get back to it, the whole idea of social entrepreneurship, which is a bit uh, to having CSOs adopt business models uh, uh, which are necessary so that they can uh, be resilient as you, 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 you stated, and also the need to identify change makers, uh, train them uh, and support their projects, uh, those that can actually come in with new ideas for their communities. And also your, your other program, the, the Knowledge and Experience Exchange Program, which is beyond the borders, right? Opening it to, to, to beyond Croatia. <coughs> so let's, uh, <coughs> let's move on to, to Nechdet, who will talk to us uh, from, uh, from a Turkish perspective. Ah, he has a PowerPoint. Yes, uh, I will ahead, share Nech. my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, civil society organization in Turkey and how is the 
uh, effect of COVID-19 uh, in Turkey. Maybe after that we can discuss uh, for the cooperation in the region. In Turkey, uh, we have uh, in this story uh, very good uh, civil society organization like foundation and uh, association. And uh, in fact, there are many uh, civil society in Turkey, but we accept only foundation and uh, association as a civil society because there are trade union chambers and uh, political parties, and they are not uh, civil society. They are uh, created by the law. That's why uh, in Turkey we accept two uh, type of uh, civil society organization. They are uh, association and foundation. Uh, let me give uh, some figures in Turkey. Uh, how is the uh, number of the association? In the recent year, the number of the association is rising. Nowadays, we have uh, 122,000 association registered in Turkey, and the number is increasing in Turkey. What is the their uh, activity area? The most of them are uh, profession and solidarity organization. The second is support, the third is uh, religion, education. But we have few children association, elder and child and uh, the other uh, association. This is the uh, activities of the association. By the region, most of uh, this association uh, located uh, in uh, west of Turkey, Marmara Central uh, and Aegean region. Uh, most of them are also located in big cities. Uh, for example, uh, 20% of the association uh, are located in Istanbul, 10% in Ankara, the rest uh, located in the uh, west of Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, also, we have uh, in historical time, from Ottoman, uh, before Ottoman, we have uh, Foundation EFCAP, we have uh, heritage from Ottoman, and nowadays we have new foundation. The number of uh, foundation is around uh, 6,000, uh, uh, and it's growing and growing year to year. Uh, during the pandemic time, uh, all parties of uh, civil society affected uh, from the COVID-19, and in Turkey, uh, government uh, accept uh, forced measure uh, place. That's why uh, association and uh, foundation post on meeting and uh, their activities. Also, they uh, postpone for the general assembly of uh, their uh, meeting. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to give some figures about the effect of uh, COVID-19. In Turkey, there are uh, two self foundations, third sector foundation, made a survey in Turkey about uh, the effect of uh, COVID 19. And there was some general question current resources, impact of COVID, etc. I'm going to share what is the effect of uh, that. Uh, the question was how did the measure taken against the COVID? pandemic affect the activities of your organization. Uh, most of them uh, said uh, they affected uh, by uh, seminar, conference, etc. They already uh, transferring this kind of thing, uh, virtual, but uh, also affected training, fundraising activities, uh, affected negatively during the pandemic time. And also uh, they ask uh, how difficult were, uh, were the last three months in terms of performing your activities with uh, contents of measurement of against the COVID-19. 19% uh, of them have difficulties. Some of them, let's say 22% of has uh, some difficulties. So most of them say they have some difficulties. And uh, uh, have you done any of the following in the past three months due to the effect of COVID-19 in your organization activities. 73% uh, of participant organization note that 
they develop a new method to reach their beneficiaries uh, for the five states that they were looking for new ground and fund uh, during the pandemic time. Uh, how was the demand for the, your activities increasing COVID-19 pandemic? 33% uh, of respondents reported a dramatic increase, while 32 state some increase. Uh, 25 said there are no change in the demand. In fact, during the pandemic time, people need help, so most of them uh, was uh, seeking need funding, etc. So most of them advised to civil society organization to help to them. Following the COVID-19 outbreak, have you made direct effect in power disadvantages communities? Uh, more than half of the respondents state that they are working directly for empowerment of the disadvantaged communities, while uh, let's say half of them don't carry such uh, activities for uh, disadvantaged group. Has the COVID-19 caused a change in number of volunteers in your organization? 57% uh, of the respondents reported that uh, there was no change in the number of volunteers. Uh, have you used any new method for maintaining an increased number of uh, volunteers' motivation during the pandemic? Uh, they said, uh, let's say, 41% uh, of them uh, say yes, uh, 59 uh, say no. Uh, has your organization received grant fund in the last year? Most of them has uh, grant from uh, previous year. Uh, what is the main sources of uh, for project uh, financing in uh, this organization? Most of them have grant from uh, European Union. The rest is uh, different sources like international organization and uh, private sector, etc. Uh, what is the purpose of grant and fund you receive? Uh, let's say 72% uh, of uh, they are used this grant uh, for implementation of a project. Uh, the rest is uh, using this kind of grant for core funding uh, activities. Have you applied any emerging grant uh, fund after the COVID-19 uh, outbreak? Uh, let's say 26% uh, of uh, civil society organization said yes, the rest will say no. Uh, how the COVID uh, impact uh, the aid and donation you receive? Uh, let's say half of the organization state degrees in aids and uh, donation they receive. Uh, so in COVID time, uh, the financial source is uh, going down. Uh, we understood from the survey. Have we made uh, making any changes in funding for rising in this year? Uh, let's say uh, 70 of the civil society staff, uh, they have changed uh, their strategies for having uh, financial funding opportunities in the, this uh, contents. What type of employees leave are you enforcing, if any, within the framework of measurement against the COVID-19? Uh, 76 states they didn't, didn't have to enforce employees' leaves, but uh, we know after the, this research, many of the uh, civil society organization has difficulties finding uh, human resources and uh, volunteers. Have you applied for short-term uh, work allowance for your employees? In Turkey, the government uh, is giving to uh, communities or enterprises short uh, work allowance. Uh, let's say 28% uh, of them applied to get uh, financial resources for the employees. Uh, have you had to dismiss any employees from organization until now? Uh, only 5% uh, uh, has uh, said uh, yes uh, for this question. 
And uh, how long do you foresee that you can sustain your current working uh, things? Uh, in fact, uh, most of them uh, are uh, optimistic, but uh, after the, this research, I am sure that most of them, uh, because of COVID continuing, they are getting the pessimistic, not optimistic. Uh, which of the following would uh, make it easier for your organization to sustain its uh, employees and activities? 67% uh, of civil society started that it would uh, grant from uh, provider increase their core funding, and so they need more funding to sustain of the human resources. Uh, I think I am going to stop here. Uh, after uh, the others uh, people or others because we can discuss for the solution for the next uh, limitos. I think I should stop here. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Najdet, for presentation and overview of, uh, uh, well, first of all, the size of civil society organizations in Turkey, associations, over 120,000 close to 6,000 foundations and, and interesting survey results about how they are coping with the COVID-19 uh, effect. Um, and, and very interesting, I noticed particular how many of them have tried to develop new methods uh, to reach their, their stakeholders, right? And, and, uh, and also very interesting that a, a large majority of them works for the empowerment of um, disadvantaged communities. Um, let's, let's move on to Bulgaria now, Kostadinka Todorova. Who, uh, floor is yours. Let's hear what is happening from your perspective. We cannot hear you. Kostadinka, your mic doesn't work. Yes, it it's works. You hear me now? Yes. 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 Yes, please go ahead. So now it's audible, yes? Yes. Always some technical some technical <laughs> issues. Even if we have so many number of meetings, there is always a challenge. Um, so really happy to be with you now and uh, share thoughts and insights about the civil society. Uh, I was listening very carefully to the Tana and Nedge that there are some similarities and issues. Of course, we come from the Balkan perspective and um, the processes, social political processes um, are not so different. Of course, there are some differences in the conjecture that um, uh, the NGOs have here and there. Um, it, um, we are living in a very dynamic um, times. And I would like just to share something, um, give some uh, perspective of the development of the NGO sector in Bulgaria. So after the transition period after the communist uh, time uh, in 1989, we still didn't have immediately uh, NGOs in the form that the uh, non-governmental sector in the form that we know it now. Um, all the non-profit organizations were governedly um, managed managed by the government. The first NGOs appeared after the constitution gave the right to, um, uh, um, after the proclaimed the freedom of association as a fundamental civic right in 1991. And since then we can speak about any development of the civil sector in Bulgaria. So we are at the dawn of the development of the civil society because um, since that moment, 30 years have passed and it's not that much for a civil society, we are still uh, children compared to other um, other societies and other communities, um, but anyway, we are going we are going through a very dynamic and difficult process of uh, establishing our, ourselves. Uh, what what can be observed? Um, because the first really the first organization, civil society organizations that had any impact appeared in 1995-1996. It coincides with the signing of uh, Barcelona Declaration. And then um, it was a constant uh, moving on and uh, having impact uh, on, the, on the local communities. Of course, at the beginning, it was more 
everything was uh, in Bulgaria was focused on moving and mobilizing the civil society on local level, not so much looking outside, but more attracting resources to empower our society um, on local and national level. Now we can speak in, um, in the recent years, in the, of course, in the, in the last uh, 15 years, we can speak on the other process. We are also outbound to other organizations sharing our experience and teaching and providing services and information. But at the beginning, it was more focused on our society, enclosed in our program, problems. And uh, there could be a definition that the NGOs in Bulgaria from the, from the 20th century are more, didn't have this impact as we have now. They were more um, outsiders and they were more detecting problems and trying to find solutions but not so uh, effectively hurt by governments. We didn't have this influence. Uh, while now we are talking about elite organizations, elite, uh, elite campaigns coming out that really influence and execute policies. So it's another level of development that we, we speak about the association of 21st century. But uh, to come to this point, uh, there have been a lot of bumps, a lot of uh, difficult moments, a lot, a lot of bumpy roads on the way, uh, because um, crises were a part of uh, our development and this transition period. Um, I would say that um, for the moment, there were a lot of, uh, because it became the, the danger sector was not an option compared to public and business sector. Uh, somehow, one of the difficulties that we have faced, it was around um, 2000 and 2010, a lot of organizations starting implementing political and business interests, which theorized a lot uh, our influence and impact, because it was a way to influence society. We were neutral, but at some point, of course, there was a way to find a way to uh, follow and chase some political or economic interests. And this has been uh, one of the problems of our, of our NGO sector. And uh, especially in the last um, couple of years, there was a big escalation of this problem, which, uh, led, to, which led to a lot of uh, negative uh, negative uh, campaigns in social media and uh, conventional media uh, towards uh, NGOs. Uh, the, the impact of NGO was really, how to say, questioned. And the role of NGO sector was really questioned in the last years because of those problems and those um, uh, roles that some NGOs were playing to, to help, help, to, help say, to protect or chase political interests and economic interests. Not all of them. But of course, there were some NGOs that had that had this um, this role in our society, and uh, this is uh, by all national reports every year. It's obvious. Um, somehow, um, we do not have recently we have lost the power um, as an NGO uh, to influence social processes and. Um, it's really, it's really a question to what extent we can influence, uh, uh, not influence, but uh, be support our communities. Um, because first, it's not only the COVID, but it's also the self-sustainable and self-sufficiency uh, of the NGO sector in Bulgaria. We are dependent on funding from the European Union, mainly European Union funding, a little bit from national, um, national funding like between 15 to 25 percent comes from national funding but still this money come uh, from governments and that's and here's the question what uh, Tretana raised about social entrepreneurship we cannot be uh, change makers if we are not self-resilient and if we do not generate our money uh, to address any societal problem or any community problem that appears this is something as, as a, coming from a, um, the point of a practitioner, coming from the, um, the fields, the, I really do see as a problem. I have been working for more than 21 years on project development. And if we have to reach all the goals that we have in a long-term perspective, NGOs have to be 
a sector that is not dependent on business or government. It has to be because we're talking about the third sector. But at the moment, we are dependent financially on the other two sectors. Uh, this is one big, big question, and it's not only in Bulgaria, it's all over Europe and all over the world. Uh, anyway, because we are working with a lot of Asian organizations, there this problem is quite solved. And there, from there we can have, um, because they don't have this governmental uh, funding, maybe uh, it could be good to study the example and see how they solve those problems. Uh, also, it's uh, as much that, that it's very difficult to attract, uh, now the NGO sector is less attractive than the business and the government sector for employees. We, we need um, really high quality employees because it's a high quality uh, job that we are doing as NGOs. It's not like you're coming and there is no uh, any education that teach you to be an NGO worker or working on uh, social, uh, social campaigns or doing social work the way that NGOs are doing it. Um, so it has to be, you have to have really high quality staff to be able to adapt to the needs of the, of the sector. And then here is the point, how can we, how can we be more attractive uh, and to, I don't know, to be competitive to the businesses which have a lot of resources or to the government which have stability and um, other, other, with other, other priorities and uh, let's say remuneration. Um, I don't know, maybe in terms of, um, in terms of um, the NGOs, Bulgarian NGOs and the international cooperation, we really started opening after um, more and more after entering into the European Union. It was a big, a big door was opened for the organizations and we could cooperate, but it was good. Um, first, it was the European Union. Uh, we needed to we need to see where we are according to the European policies and uh, uh, measure uh, measure where our problems, our our priorities, and see where the sector stands. But also in 2007, we automatically become part of the big family of the Annelin Foundation. Um, since that moment, I'm the head of uh, head of network of Family Foundation for Bulgaria, national network, and it has been a big develop. When I took this role, I was trying to promote uh, this Euro-Mediterranean relationship, and it was a topic and um, such such just distant from our societies. Somehow we live in this area, but it was far away from us. Although the problems were quite similar, but this region looked um, very far and um, it seemed that um, we don't need to do so many projects or to cooperate because this is not our problem. Uh, in the last couple of uh, years, this problem because of the refugee crisis, because of the problems in the Middle East, because of um, the economic trade, because of the socio-cultural relationship that we built more intensively, it's on the daily agenda. And it's, it's very, very important for, for Bulgaria at the moment. A lot of organizations are building strong, um, strong uh, relationship with uh, organizations from all the Euromed uh, area. And we do not see it start so far away. Only 10 years have passed, but the situation has changed dramatically. And it was a sudden shift because we live in a common, common space where the stability, the peace, the understanding is very important. And I can say just one thing, because during one of the meetings that we had with um, Annelind members, one of our national meeting, we have invited uh, clubs, um, people that um, people living here in Bulgaria, the club of uh, Arab, Arab, Arab wives. And it seemed that Bulgaria is much closer to those Arab countries than to north of Europe. We share more uh, culinary, uh, culinary heritage. Also, many of the fairy tales of children are based on stories coming from the Middle East. So we have understood that many of the characters that we, I have known and I have grown up with are the ones that are the, the children from uh, Syria and uh, Jordan are growing up with. Um, this proximity and these similarities have to be have to be shared, 
in order to avoid all those stereotypes or break those stereotypes and create a space for understanding and acceptance. Uh, I don't know about the COVID situation. I would say that uh, we have to observe development of the NGO sector till COVID and after COVID. These are two different era because nobody expected that. Nobody had the tools to, to continue. It was a, such a uh, sudden shift in providing our services. We could not stop exist. We couldn't stop existing as, an NG, as NGOs, but we were not also prepared to deliver the services to our beneficiaries. Uh, so one of the, the negative thing was that uh, we have to, to test on the go. We had to test uh, different methods. And I have spoken to many NGOs from Bulgaria. Uh, it was a way of um, trying, and this works. OK, we can use this way of uh, this model of work. This doesn't work, so we leave it. Uh, still, we are building, and we have a project on uh, collecting all effective tools for digital work in the NGO field, not only on culture or youth, but in any, any field, uh, any, any, any sector. But one good thing is that uh, this COVID opened, um, normally when, you, when we have a project, you focus yourself on local level, regional level, national level, maybe international, excluding, if you work on international, you're excluding the local participants. So vice versa, you're working on local level and you exclude the international participants from, participants from uh, national, from uh, other areas in the country. But now COVID opened this possibility of uh, meeting. Now there is no there is no frontier. You are in front of the computer, and people can meet, and it's um, a common platform where we can share our knowledge. Sometimes the language is a problem, but uh, it also disappears as a as a real obstacle. And this was I, I would uh, I would like to finish with this positive aspect of COVID because COVID gave us the perspective that we can we can deliver not only local or national or regional, we can implement regional projects, but it can be more open. It opened the door to the world where we can all share our experiences inside and have these virtual exchanges. And I believe, I hope that, um, as Svetlana said, I really believe that we're going to meet in physically. Physical meetings are really important for building the cooperation and friendship. But we can also use this balance between online, where we cannot meet so many people or because of financial or any other obstacles. It can be the online tools that we already have at stake, but also the physical meeting. So next, maybe the next generation will be able to manage effectively both, um, both approaches. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so you're also ending on a positive note. Uh, but it is true because, you know, especially your last uh, point, uh, we are moving, I think, towards some sort of hybrid world. Uh, I can see this in the education sector. I'm, I'm sure my, my colleagues uh, <laughs> that are also in the education sector probably agree with me. And uh, here you are, you and Setana as, as uh, civil society practitioners, you can also see this. And so we have to cope. And, I, and it's interesting, I, I really agree that uh, COVID-19 might have challenged us in many ways, but it's also, I mean, open and a wealth of possibilities about how we can do our work and, and the, it has opened the door, you said, to the world. And I think it's, uh, you're, you're very much uh, right about this. Um, now I'll give the floor to Muli uh, Peleg to, to, to hear his perspective. Uh, and while uh, Muli is talking, I, um, I'm asking the audience also, if you have any questions, start putting them in the chat uh, or in the Q&A segment on Zoom and or on Facebook, if you're following us, uh, just write your questions on uh, the CIS page and I will uh, try to ask the speakers to comment on it. Muli, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and honor to share the screen with you guys. And uh, I was impressed by your presentations. Uh, I'm not the only uh, non-European in the panel, uh, but I'm also the new kid on the block, which really means that um, the Israeli um, head of network, the Oranim College, which I represent here, uh, we are just in the uh, process, the early and preliminary stages of putting our network together. Um, so far, so good. 
but I definitely don't have the broad perspective and rich data um, about the network as my colleagues, my predecessors here on the panel uh, presented and discussed. Um, so since I'm the novice here in the, um, in the Annaline Foundation framework, I'm just learning the ropes. And I also came in when um, international traffic came to a standstill in the last year. Um, that really gave a spin to our efforts. And therefore, I'm going to talk mainly less about the Euromed partnership, which is highly important and critical in my view, and more about the situation, um, the unique situation in Israel, in the civil society in Israel, especially in the days of, uh, of COVID. Of COVID. Um, and um, I want to mention briefly that um, the virtual world is, is kind and auspicious to, to, to a civic society and what it tries to do. Because as, uh, as my uh, Bulgarian colleague uh, mentioned, it is easily connecting people. Um, but this is just a point of departure. You cannot really have a virtual revolution or uh, social initiatives. You need to be in, in, the, in the town hall or in the square, shoulder to shoulder and feel the pulse of, of social reform and social change. But having said that, uh, we are progressing through uh, this uh, virtual world. We have around uh, 2000, uh, 2000, sorry, 200 organizations by now. Um, and they are representing all the, uh, as we uh, call it here in Israel, all four tribes of the Israeli society, the uh, various composition of the Israeli society is, is well um, represented in our network. And our main goal, our main effort um, is geared towards social sustainability because there are, uh, you probably know, uh, internal uh, and profound rifts within the Israeli society. So intercultural dialogue for us is not only external with other countries and other cultures, but it's also um, an internal endeavors because we have various cultures within us. And um, the Annalyn Foundation certainly gives us an opportunity to do that, but also to collaborate with uh, colleagues from countries and cultures that we don't commonly interact with, such as uh, Tunisia, Morocco, Egypt, but most importantly, with our neighbors and our cousins, the Palestinians. And this is uh, where the heart of the, of the matter lies. Um, so I want to I want to uh, talk about some of the uh, interesting um, uh, developments uh, in the situation in the current situation in Israel, and I want to start with um, presenting some uh, numbers of the current predicament of the COVID in order to um, give us uh, some kind of a proportion, um, some kind of a good measure of where we stand in Israel. So the uh, the number of people that got sick. Uh, from the start, uh, from uh, last February, is uh, 693,000 people, all in all, the general number. Today, those who are confirmed, 68,000 people. We have 5,130 people dead, and the number of uh, vaccinated, and this is an interesting number, is 3,500,000. Um, and uh, this is out of the population of 9,300,000, which is roughly around 38% people vaccinated. Just for um, you know, uh, comparison, uh, the, the percentage in the United States is 7.7%. So in Israel, it's 38%. So we are very high uh, on the list with regard to vaccinations. I don't know what it means, with regard to values and norms and beliefs, but these are the raw numbers. Uh, make your own analysis about this. So there are some uh, disheartening facts uh, about this situation with regard to the Israeli civic society, but there are some good signs and, and positive signs. So I wanna start with the bed. These are relative terms, of course. So there is, um, and I guess uh, similarly to other countries in the world, other societies, there is a severe amount of tension and stress among Israelis. Um, 
we, we've just experienced three extended lockdowns, a struggling economy, and an unstable political system that goes to the polls again on March 23rd for the fourth time within the, the last two years. This is unprecedented. For Israelis, going out of the country is really um, exclusively or almost exclusively flying abroad. And when the main international airport is sealed, it means really a psychological sense of siege. And I would say also uh, an obstruction of freedom that many people feel. More so than in other countries that have territorial cognitivity, which we don't enjoy much because of the certain geopolitical situation around us. The expansion of the pandemic within the, within the Israeli society really draws the boundaries and underlines the differences between the, what I mentioned before, the four tribes, Jews and Arabs, seculars and religious, and also the ultra-Orthodox, the, the Haredim as we call it here. Now the number of people inflicted with the disease is much higher and disproportionate within the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox, and the Arab populations. And this is due to several reasons, uh, lifestyle, cultural reasons, socioeconomic reasons, and political reasons that really empowered and um, augmented each other. There's also um, reasons and factors such as defiance of uh, certain groups within those populations, um, challenging the uh, state's legitimacy and authority. And this is um, a relevant op opportunity for them through their eyes to do that. And also uh, some um, hesitations and um, lack of uh, enthusiasm from the forces of the law to really implement the law in certain places. Now to the good side of the equation. COVID gave us, all of us, but I noticed it in Israel, especially in the, in the civic society, time to think, perspective. It humbled us, I think, and it created mental and emotional space to consider new possibilities, to dare, to reprioritize our priorities, to observe things and possibilities in different lights. I, I would say, and I'm, I'm putting my, sociolog uh, my political sociologist hat now, um, in ordinary times, regular times, people succumb to routine and standard procedures. Under unique conditions of duress, new and bold ideas emerge. Um, Denial and delay are the two privileges, and I would say the two excuses of uh, ongoing practices and uh, duties are replaced by fresh thinking and bold out of the box initiatives. For example, in our case, uh, the uh, discourse of shared society between Jews and Arabs in Israel is booming, is becoming more and more prominent and people on both sides raise ideas that were not common before, were not heard before in, in regular days. And in this regard, another development which I see is very positive and very elating. I think that uh, another significant development that became salient in, in this last year was the prominent role of Arab citizens in the Israeli health system. The spotlight on hospitals, on clinics, on vaccinations, on checkups, suddenly revealed the exceptional number of Arab MDs, medical doctors, experts, and nurses in the field. And this fact really raised the awareness and appreciation of many Jews to consider Arabs as equally sharing the burden and as legitimate, respectable citizens. That's not something to be taken for granted because there are images, there are associations, there are generalizations of the other that every society is inflicted by. And in Israel uh, also as well because of the history, because of the situation in the region. And, and this opportunity uh, gave um, many Israelis the, uh, the chance of rethinking their attitudes and their value 
and their image of the other in general and of Arabs in particular. Now, another interesting uh, development that I, that I have noticed. Since government and business were so entrenched in coping with this crisis and maintain order and stability, the regular vertical engagement between them and the third sector, the civil society, were somewhat neglected. Now, I'm talking about the attempts of social control, social order, social supervision, power hierarchies. These were somewhat relaxed. And consequently, the horizontal interactions within the third sector, within the civil society, were given more leeway and more time to develop and rebuild themselves. In our case, some of our most salient projects, such as the Galilee Dreamers that take high schoolers, Arab and Jewish high schoolers from the Galilee and bring them together in order to build a framework for a future so, a shared society for them has really taken over and, and um, became much more prominent than it was before. Or uh, for example, another organization which is part of our network called Root. And Roots is an organization that brought together Jewish Orthodox rabbis and Palestinians residents to discuss coexistence and how to live together. And another organization, which is also part of our network called 5050 Startup, which brings Israelis and Palestinians, young Israelis and Palestinians together that believe that a brighter future for everybody in the region has to do with economics, with entrepreneurship, not with politics, not with diplomacy, not with uh, political leaders telling them what to do. It's a bottom-up process, a grassroots process that really uh, became very um, empowered and um, gain new momentum, I think because of the days of COVID. This trend was disrupted only by one vertical interaction, albeit irregular in nature. And this is a cons consistent demonstration and protest against our prime minister, which by the way, his trial began today. And, and one last point that I want to mention is, is uh, with regard to extremism. One of the few positive things that one might find in the global pandemic is that it quells and marginalizes extremism and zealotry. You don't hear much about ISIS. You don't hear much about Chechnya or other freedom fighters, violent freedom fighters around the world lately. People have other worries, other deprivation that terrorists can, terrorism cannot heal. Potential extremists are thwarted by the weight of the plague because they also get sick. But there is some calm in the air, temporary as it may be, not because of moderation or reasonableness, mind you, but due to objective circumstances and the common enemy of us all. So here, I think, as it was mentioned earlier, my optimism is taking hold. And hopefully through the Annalid Foundation, we'll be able to pursue all those initiatives that I mentioned. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, I mean, the optimism is out there, uh, like every one of your of the previous speakers. It, it's very interesting that you talk about, uh, and I was thinking about Greek society, and maybe Turkish society in that sense, uh, but maybe also Bulgarian and Croatian, but at least the Greek and Turkish society about the stress, the stress that uh, the average Israeli lives in. I've been in this country in Turkey for 11 years, and I know my Turkish friends and colleagues are constantly under stress. And as a Greek uh, from a country that's still trying to recover from uh, the economic crisis, and, and now with COVID, the stress is a given, plus heightened by tensions between Greece and Turkey. So, um, so it, it's interesting how that has an, um, is something that we, need, we, we don't factor in as much, but it's out there. But it's also very interesting how, um, 
what you said, I mean, you know, within the Israeli context, how um, COVID uh, with its good and bad things, but especially the horizontal intervention among civil society organizations have been strengthened and new gra grassroots processes. And, and when you were talking about some of the interaction by some of the uh, CSOs uh, in the Israeli network, Annalyn network, uh, those between Orthodox Jews and uh, Arabs or uh, between young Jews and, uh, and Arabs, I keep thinking because one of the activities that I do uh, here in Istanbul is to try to bring together young Greeks and Turks. And I've been doing this for five or six years. And, and for exactly the same reason that you've mentioned that these groups do it, right? And, and while up to now, every year it's been either in Istanbul or somewhere in Greece, uh, groups of 30, 40 people in person. Last year I had to do the event online, but it was interesting, first of all, of the interest of young Greeks and Turks to take part at times of heightened tension. It wasn't just COVID and the restrictions, but heightened tensions in Greece and Turkey. And the fact that I was able to reach uh, people, Greeks and Turks from other parts of the world that would have had difficulty to come. So I had people in Chicago, a Turk in Chicago, a Greek in Washington, a Greek in Poland, a Turk in Brussels. I mean, that would have been very difficult to get them to come to our uh, in-person meetings. And, and the fact that they're interested in, in reaching out. And, and I think this is also very uh, interesting. Um, and plus your last point about, uh, very interesting from a sociological perspective too, as you mentioned, how the global pandemic has quelled and marginalized, as you said, extremism and zealotry, which is also true. We don't hear much about it because priorities are different. Of course, you know, in Greece, if one follows the news, something I would be doing with this webinar now, first issue right now, is COVID, 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 and how the government is not doing it right or doing it right or whatever. And the second issue is Turkey, Turkey, Turkey. At times, Turkey is first, COVID is second. So the stress is always there, right? Uh, but we don't hear about other things so much. So I am, again, reminding the audience to start asking questions if they want. But as we've had this first uh, tour de table, I, I was also thinking, you know, uh, I, I say, I keep thinking whether it's something you raised, Muli, but everybody, whether our social consciousness has become unchanged because of the crisis and how do you build from that, right? I mean, it's something that uh, after we went through our phase at the beginning, whether at personal level or our institutional level of, you know, our lives have been, been upended, then what do you do about it, right? You, you have to live, you have to survive, you have to be positive, you have to build, right? Uh, we are all responsible. We have uh, some of us are students, others are stakeholders. They need, they expect things from us. And so it's interesting how these initiatives have been formed. And, 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 and as I, looking at the notes that I've taken, <clears throat> I, yeah, I, I think there's stuff out there where one can start moving beyond the national context to, um, the regional to the interregional context, the north and south. I mean, it's interesting what Costa Nica was talking about. You realize, you know, the culinary similarities and other similarities, right? Or the storytelling, things that you know from your childhood and how we are all interlinked because we live in our own little spaces and bubbles. Um, so, so and, and also the issue of, of um, that social entrepreneurship, um, I also wanted to say when I forgot when Costa Dica was talking about the bad name some NGOs have given to the CSO community in Bulgaria. This is a point actually at Stefanos Valianatos, the Greek head of network, raised in the last webinar because something similar in a different context has happened in the Greek <laughs> NGO sector. Uh, and, and, and this has given CSOs a bad name and, and uh, most of them do great and wonderful things. Some of the bad apples, like in every society, but you know, sometimes they, especially in societies that are more, as as, as Muli said, vertical, right? There's there's a top down as opposed to bottom up, and this is the purpose of. Uh, I mean, this is what we try to do. So, um, is there anything any of you, of you uh, as we await uh, comments, any of you uh, are interested that want to raise, uh, inspired by the presentations of the others? I know, Nedj, that you also had some conclusions that you wanted to raise. Um, we are having a discussion. So anyone wants to give, take the floor, please go ahead. Nobody, nobody wants to talk. 
I just want to mention that uh, I think part of the, uh, dare I say, the, po the uh, growing popularity of the civil society also stems from uh, some kind of uh, erosion of uh, trust in government or, or in the authorities. Um, justifiably or not, um, because you know nobody knows anything about COVID. There are a limited uh, amount of knowledge, but there's a lot of uh, you know speculations and, and, and guesses and conspiracies and other things around uh, there. So the more your trust in government erodes, the more your participation in alternative centers of power, I would say, or uh, social cycles um, grow because you, th you seek alternatives. You just don't want to stay idle. Uh, not everybody, right? But people who tend to be involved. So if the government disappoints you or leaves you in the dark, you tell yourself, okay, so I'll join other people, not in high places, and we'll try to understand things on our own uh, and get together. And, and uh, you know, a sense of solidarity. We are all in the mud but some of us are looking at the stars. This is, this is George Bernard Shaw. Um, but, um, you know, if, if you are empowered by others, then the activity in, 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 in your organization, uh, in your society, in your community, uh, really uh, gives you a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose, and uh, strengthen you in the face of uncertainty and failing government or... Uh, you know, lack of uncertain, you know, uncertainty. So I think there is this pendulum uh, that they, they both, those two uh, trends or tendencies uh, relate to one another. Uh, you know, when I looked at the list of, uh, of countries or members in Anna Lind, I thought, I, I, I was surprised to, to uh, notice that the, greater, the, the greatest amount of members in a network came from Palestine. And then, it, it became obvious to me when when you don't have a reaffirmed um, you know set um, government uh, which don't have my, a legitimacy outside of the world uh, again justifiably or not uh, where you stand is when you where you sit is where you stand then your civil society becomes uh, very um, you know engaged very active so this is why this is a good opportunity. Mm -hmm you know, uh, unintended, but a good opportunity for the civil society to uh, really prosper. Yeah, you know, listening to you, I was thinking also at our last uh, session in December, uh, Zain Al-Haq, who is the head of Network from Lebanon, was talking, there's a particular case, right? Civil society, because institutions don't work, both with the explosion in Beirut, but also throughout, uh, you know, the COVID, the civil society are doing the, the job of the state and institutions. Right. Exactly. Right, as first responders and as other things, uh, and and and, uh, uh, but that's an extreme situation there, and they, it has adapted in a sense to the fact to the reality that things do not work in Lebanon, and and so uh, they've taken on that role to the point where she was actually saying how there should be uh, funding for CSOs uh, uh, for this kind of job that they are actually doing, uh, the job that uh, municipalities, the state institutions uh, should actually be doing. Uh, Nechdet, uh, you want to say something? Yes. Uh, you know, COVID-19 threats all aspects of life, including uh, works of human military training, civil society organization. This organization, which already works with limited human resources, limited uh, financial resources, create valuable output through donation and grant, have postponed all their events uh, everywhere. Uh, it is uh, vital for civil society in the Mediterranean region to be eligible for economic assistance grant to other sectors. It is vital for Mediterranean civil society to endure this crisis and come out of it is a war of war. So uh, in this context, uh, we should uh, uh, continue our collaboration in the Mediterranean area. Uh, 
uh, in this context, uh, Condominium Foundation is supporting many projects in the Euro Mediterranean area. Uh, we had a project from Condominium Foundation. We are uh, developing uh, courses uh, for civil society uh, in this uh, region. We are uh, creating, uh, let's say, interactive learning courses, e-learning courses. For example, uh, there are courses, how do you manage civil society, how do you uh, fund rising activities, uh, how is your, uh, let's say, communication aspect in the civil society sector, how do you develop advocacy, uh, and uh, how do you, uh, let's say, support uh, leadership. So we are developing uh, these courses in five languages, in Arabic in the, in the region, and uh, in English, uh, German, French, and Turkish. Uh, we are, uh, let's say, meet of uh, this project uh, at the April, at the beginning of April. We are going to open an e-learning platform for the Euro Mediterranean area to have the capacity building for civil society. So, in this sector, we should uh, support cooperation with the civil society. If uh, civil society make cooperation in Mediterranean countries, I'm sure government and uh, the other sector will continue and support the uh, cooperation in uh, this uh, sector. So, we are in the same boat in uh, ocean, in Mediterranean area, we should support uh, cooperation in uh, civil society. Thank you. Absolutely right. And uh, this is uh, looking forward to seeing the out outputs of this project that you mentioned. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes because some of our speakers have to leave. But you, I see that Kosadinka has raised her hand. But before I, I give her the floor, um, I, I would like to read one of the comments. I mean, from Stefanos Vallanatos, who's the Greek head of network, and he's saying, Listening to Kostadinka and making comparisons with the Greek realities, I can realize a kind of underdevelopment in the sense that either there seems to exist the need to realize the position and role of civil society, and therefore it's branding. Uh, and thus, he says, we can build an autonomous civil society sector working alongside as an equal to the other two pillars of society, the state and the market. So it's a general comment inspired by your words, but Kostadinska, you have the floor. So referring back to the comment that Stefan has made and also what I heard from Muni and you, Dimitri, um, there is a new phenomenon appearing in Bulgaria, which I forgot to mention before. These are the involvement of informal groups because of the lower trust into the civil society, because of the problems and the anti-campaign towards um, CSOs. Not, ever, not all, but we are now put under one line. So that the, the mistrust goes to everybody. Uh, there is this phenomenon in the last um, year and a half, one year, of uh, activities and involvement of informal groups that have a short-term goal. They are organizing very successful um, social campaigns. They, um, and um, it's something that we can, uh, we can uh, how to say, learn from uh, the experience. Because normally NGOs, we are becoming slower in addressing a social problem. Here, this is a group of people interested, organized uh, throughout the social media in a very short manner around one, uh, one common issue or topic or problematic. And they are attacking and addressing this issue uh, with a very, how to say, contemporary modern approach. Um, and it would be really nice to have this, uh, um, how to say, autonomous social civil society as everyone is saying, this is the ideal thing that we can do and this should be the role of, C of uh, CSOs in our communities. But this was, uh, I mean, it came to my mind and I forgot to mention before, I don't know if it exists in other countries, but these informal groups are becoming very powerful and influential in Bulgarian societies. Um, and the other thing that uh, Muli said, I would I'll be really happy if uh, he passes the information for this organization to believe the economic and cultural development would be, um, an alternative to political development. This is something that I have always supported. And I say that we need a community 
that develops economically and culturally together with the political. And in the, in the course of time, we have to drop the, the political development because we don't need it. If we are growing and our conscience is quite um, developed and raised, and we have the value that we should have as a society, uh, then we are not going to need any more the political power or political management. We need just simply economic and cultural development as human beings. Okay, uh, you raised very, very interesting points. And I think your last point is very much with another question, I think uh, for Muli by, by Stephanos again, where uh, he asks Muli whether he considers that these experiences that he outlined in Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian presence in Israeli society can lay the groundwork uh, and challenge of some of the basic tenets of, of what we consider as fundamentals to the nation state model. And I think there's a big debate about this because the nation state is being challenged and it's not effective. We know that, we can see it. I mean, you know, Muli can talk about what is it, 38% or so of Israelis have been vaccinated. I think the statistics out there are showing that Croatia, for example, it will take 7.4 years right now for everyone to be vaccinated, right? Uh, it's the worst case right now in Europe at the rate it's going and other countries might take four and five years. So uh, it, and it makes you wonder uh, <laughs> whether that model is effective. So, so therefore, Muli says whether there is a the need to come up with a different paradigm if we are to coexist peacefully. Uh, Muli, Stefano says this and asks yeah. Muli, uh, yeah. model paradigm to coexist peacefully and creatively. Go ahead, yeah. Muli. I just want to ask if is if anybody knows about a vaccination against violence, that would be helpful. And I just you know that's, one remark. That's called a lobotomy. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. Oh, Muli stuck. Okay. Well, I'm sure he'll come back. Uh, something happened. Anyway, we have about, uh, until he comes back, we have about five minutes or so. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, yeah, back. I'm back. I just, uh, yeah, one, one uh, uh, remark to Kostadinka in uh, parenthesis. My father's family is, uh, is from Bulgaria. He's, my father is from Vauna. So I just want to mention this, talking about intercultural communication, intercultural dialogue. <laughs> We're more or less the same. You know, Bulgarian food and Bulgarian music is in my heart. So just for you to know. Um, yes, I think it has a potential of changing the model because uh, a nation state is irrelevant in the case of Israel. There is a state, but there are several uh, nations and several affiliations. And it, it, can, it has a potential of changing it uh, in a, in a bottom-up process, which is more, it's a longer process, prostructed, uh, prostructinated and tedious and cumbersome, but it has a potential of changing it because one simple, th uh, one simple thing, uh, when you get to know the other, you know, capital O, when you get to know the other, gradually, surely, you start thinking in terms of individuals and the categorical things about the other. Oh, they're all the same. We know them, they're, they're kind. Uh, break is breaking a part of the seams because you get to know the people, you get to know their world, you get to know their culture and, and, and you get to know them on, on a one-to-one -one basis and your attitude changes. I uh, carried a research uh, project that was funded by Columbia University for three years in a mixed town in Israel called Ramleh uh, between Jews and Arabs. And um, they got to know one another and, and you know, it was a process and, and a workshop with all kinds of models, doesn't matter, but they identified themselves. The, the core uh, project was about identity and how do you think about yourself vis-a-vis -vis the other? So at first, they identified themselves with the uh, uh, farthest away uh, terms and concepts from the other. I'm not him, I'm more me. But bit by bit, when they got to know the other, they all defined themselves as not Jews and Arabs, not Jews and Muslims, but as Ramlians. We are all from Ramleh. And they all got together on a common ground. They shed those defense mechanism of the categorical thinking and start to see the other as a person with the respect and dignity that every individual deserves. So I believe if we are con consistent enough and brave enough, this will carry fruit. At the end of this process, it has to be continued and it won't be done by the government. 
and it won't be done by the business sector. They have their own interests. It can be done in the most effective way by the civil society sector. Very good. Uh, Stefan was replying saying this is dialogue. And, and as I was listening to you, I, I keep thinking, one of my students that I, a doctoral student at my university of Kadir has, you know, he, I, I asked him one day where he was from because I could not understand uh, from the, his accent. And actually, and, and he, I guess his educational background, and he goes, um, his name was Mehmet, his name is Mehmet. He goes, well, I'm a Cypriot of Turkish descent. And I like the way he, play, he put it because it's exactly what you're saying. It's uh, not a Turkish Cypriot, a Greek Cypriot. I come from this place called, I happen to be a Turkish Cypriot, but I'm primarily first a Cypriot, right? And so it, it's, it's uh, how uh, it, it's about the other. And, and the other is, is a very interesting imagery. I think in our Euromed region uh, between our countries, I mean, part of the biggest difficult differences between Greece and Turkey is how we view each other and see the other and, uh, and, and, and uh, how do you overcome this? Okay, well, I, uh, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for this very interesting discussion. I mean, as I said, this has been part of this project where I've already made, taken some points from the things you've said, uh, and it's coming together on how you can put these, we'll be doing further research within the context uh, of, of, you know, uh, civil society, where civil society can go, is going in the Euromed region. And, and um, I look forward to our continued engagement. I'm very happy to have met most of you, Svetana, Muli, and Kostadinka. Nechdet is an old friend. Uh, we've tried to see each other last year, but COVID destroyed that, right? <laughs> but um, and, but uh, we'll keep this going. I think our next, um, our next webinar will be on the 15th of March, where our Spanish colleague will be joining us, and then we are working on a, a couple of other speakers as well. And uh, we'll stay in touch. And uh, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Uh, have a thank nice you. evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.